Hello and welcome to Quentin's Questions, where I ask questions to leading figures in the energy and electric vehicle markets, the sort of things that are concerning consumers. We're here at the British Motor Museum in Gaydon in Warwickshire, who are hosting us. And I'm talking today to Graham Cooper, the head of future markets at National Grid, who will tell us if the grid can cope and his experiences of running an electric car for 45,000 miles. Can the grid cope with all these electric cars? So the short answer is it will be fine. But people don't want a short answer, let me give you a little more detail. So firstly, this is a transition, it's not a cliff edge, right? The other thing is the grid has been changing tremendously over the last 20 years. We've gone from principally coal driven. The UK is now powered by more clean energy than by burning stuff. So the change going forward for cars is just a continuation of the change of where powers come from. People just don't get renewables and they don't understand that we're there already, aren't we? We are. 45% of the electricity we are burning or using today has been created renewably yes. and low carbon and sustainably. Absolutely, absolutely. And the government has signalled that it actually wants the entire UK's energy system to be clean by 2035. And do you think that is a, an aspiration that is possible? So I'm going to give you that it's challenging but achievable. If it was easy, we'd have done it. To, yeah. we'd, we'd do it tomorrow. Um, so, uh, but it, it absolutely, um, we will be in a place very close to 2035 where the energy system is clean. And that is definitely a goal worth fighting for because of air yes. quality, public health and, and, and cheaper energy too. Yes, yeah, absolutely. So a couple of things that come to mind is, firstly, up until about 2017, the dirtiest thing we did as a country was make electricity. Mm -hmm. you know, we burnt coal and gas. That was, that was where it all came from. Um, when we rolled from 2017 into 2018, transport became the dirtiest thing we do. Now, it's not because transport suddenly got dirtier, it's because and making it's power cool. got cleaner. But also, what's nice is, now, the cheapest way of making electricity is through solar and wind. So we're currently in this sort of, um, you know, the news today is, is around high energy prices. That's driven by global gas price. So actually, the way to get bills cheaper is not stop building renewables and have more gas. It's to stop using gas and build, and build more renewables. Another apprehension is, is, is the, the, the renewables, that they are intermittent, they are variable, and the wind won't blow and the sun won't shine, and then all of a sudden our, our reliance on renewables will mean, again, the lights will go off. Is, is that a, a, a realistic apprehension? But the UK is a world leader in wind, OK? We've got lots installed onshore, particularly in Scotland. It's the windiest place in Europe but actually offshore, very, very windy. So the UK's got 10 gigawatts of offshore wind today. We're gonna to get to 40 gigawatts by 2030, right? If you put a ring fence around that, that would power all of road transport electrically. Just that wind? Just that wind alone. I mean, admittedly, the energy's gonna be used for other things, but just to give a, 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 an idea of scale. But also the variability is really important, right? We can pause charging when the wind doesn't blow. We can prompt charges to start when there's an excess of wind. We've never had that before. So people perceive that electric vehicles are actually a problem for the energy system. They actually bring as much of a solution as they bring a problem. Tell me how important the battery is going to be in, in, in future energy storage. Oh, really critical. I mean, we, we're going to need flexibility everywhere, but batteries do two things. There's movement of energy, you know, it's being generated now, store it, use it another time. But also batteries respond really fast. So the grid needs to be stable. It needs to be even and consistent everywhere, otherwise things trip out. So as well as it being an energy uh, tool, it's also a system tool for running grids in a really stable way when you have more renewables on them. So transitioning from fossil fuels to batteries is a reasonable aspiration, isn't it? Oh, it's, not only is it reasonable, um, it's almost legislated for. So on the journey to net zero, right, as a country, we've signed up globally to have carbon budgets. Now, admittedly, it's market driven, but it's driven by legislation, setting targets and market response to those targets. There's a great fear out there of the change to electrification, to electric cars, to batteries. 
What would you say to that? Are, are people justified in, in, in fearing all this? We fear uncertainty and we fear what we don't understand, which is why I think it's important not to be preachy about electric cars. The best way to do this is for people to bust their own myths. Ask someone when you see them charging what their experience is like. Go book a test drive or go to the Milton Keynes Experience Centre, borrow one, hire one. I, I did 45,000 miles in my last electric car at a little under 2p a mile. My energy bill's gone up in the meantime, right? And I've just done the calculation, just got a new electric car, and I think I'll run this one at about 3p a mile. That's pushing the boat out. Yeah, well, it's quite extravagant, to, I admit. <laughs> to people who say that batteries on electric cars wear out and you'll have to replace them every three or four years, what would you say to that? Uh, experience tells us that the battery will outlive the car. And if you want a longer answer, what you'll probably see is cars, when they get to 100, 150,000 miles and are a bit tired, the manufacturer is likely to have the car back from you, take the battery out, put it in a shiny box and sell you back the battery for home storage. Tell us about the cost of your electric car. So people think electric cars are expensive and the windscreen price looks like that, but the cost is in running it. My personal experience is in 45,000 miles, I only put one set of tyres on the car and a wiper blade. So actually the cost was tiny to run and also it didn't depreciate much. So actually the cost to use was far cheaper than the equivalent petrol or diesel. Graham, there's a, a, a big body of people who say that we shouldn't be wasting our time with electrification. We should go straight to hydrogen. Tell me whether they're right or wrong. So firstly, hydrogen is going to be really important on the journey to net zero. We cannot get to net zero without hydrogen. Things that can go electric need to go electric for the purposes of efficiency. If you do a mile in a battery electric car, you'd need four or five times the amount of power to do the same mile in a hydrogen car. However, very heavy uh, trucks could well go hydrogen. Um, we're going to need a lot of hydrogen for industrial processes. So that's really why for cars, can only ever really see it being, being uh, battery electric. Just the relative efficiency means you wouldn't do it for hydrogen. Now, I'm not saying we won't need hydrogen for very heavy goods vehicles and shipping and aviation industrial processes. We will. But when the technology is already ready for cars to go electric, and it's very, very efficient. Why would you do anything else? 30% of the population don't have off-street parking, yes. somewhere to, to charge their cars. Yes. What are they going to do? They can't drive electric cars, can they? Yeah, at the moment, they don't have a fuel pump either at the, on the curb or, or wherever they park their car. So they'll refuel their electric car just like they do with a petrol car. But there will be more options. You might go to a hub, which will look like a petrol station today, and charge. But also you might charge whilst you do a gym class at the gym or you might charge at your office whilst you're doing a day's work, or charge at the station where you get on a train to go into town. So there will be a whole range of options. Just because you can't charge at home doesn't mean you can't have an electric car. So for people watching this who aren't sure about an EV and don't know what to do and have, have all this anti-EV stuff going on, what would you say to them? So you, you know I've been a complete petrol head for a long time, for most of my life. But I've just had 45,000 miles of driving an EV over the last three or four years. Changed my world, right? Don't fear change. It is really good to try something new. And when you try it, you realise all of your fears disappear. What I would say to people is, if you can't make the change now, you don't have to make the change now. This is a transition, not a cliff edge. But have an open mind and maybe even ask somebody. If you see someone charging a car, ask them about it. They'll tell you their real-world experience, and that'll cut through all of the fear, uncertainty and doubt. My thanks to Graham Cooper, to the National Grid, the British Motor Museum and British Vault for helping make this possible. See you next time for another Quentin's Questions.